Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. The text that serves as the basis of the lesson is Philippians chapter 3. If you have a Bible with you or if you have your phone with you or some other device and you want to read along, I'll begin by reading that text. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 9 in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. When a group of strangers come together for a meeting, it's common for the moderator to begin with an introductory icebreaker, as it's sometimes called, a game or activity that's designed to ease tension and relieve formality. And the most effete expression of this exercise, I think, entails each attendant taking a few minutes to tell the group a little bit about themselves. In other words, each participant is given an opportunity to define their identity in just a few sentences. Now, being an extreme introvert, as I am, which sometimes I think perhaps I'm just a bit more observant than the rest of you, but being an extreme introvert, I, of course, despise all of these kinds of activities. And I usually crack under the pressure of having to sum up the meaning, purpose, and value of my life in 30 seconds. But perhaps I'm the only one who finds that kind of a task daunting. And yet this, the anfektungen, the anguish of the soul that I experience, has not prevented me from noting a pattern to our responses. One which may expose what I think is a prevalent and yet inadequate sense of self. When asked the question, who are you, Westerners typically respond with the following triad of characteristics. First, our name. Second, our title or occupation. And then third, our immediate familial relationships, like my wife's name is Pam and we have five children, etc. Now, for more traditional cultures, like in Zimbabwe, the name of your father, as well as the town or village in which you were raised, and of course the tribe that you were born into are all what constitute your sense of self. And we can see this in the Bible, Simon Barjona, Simon who's the son of Jonah, or Saul of Tarsus. Or uh, the name of a preacher in Zimbabwe is Nelson Dewa. Dewa is the tribe that he was born into. And the totem of that tribe is the lion. Over about a six-year period, I spent a lot of time in the country of Zimbabwe, and I think it was on my third or fourth trip that the men over there decided that I needed to be placed into a tribe. So I thought, oh, that's cool. I'm going to be in a tribe. And so they sort of huddled together and discussed it, and they came over and said, okay, Brad, you're in the Soko tribe. And I thought, oh, cool. What's the totem of the Soko tribe? And they said, a monkey. (laughs) A monkey. And I'll have to admit that at that point, my late modern self sort of bristled all of a sudden under being assigned an identity. I thought, you know, wow, this is really quite oppressive. I didn't notice before how oppressive these traditional cultures are. You know, I really don't feel like being a monkey. Um, I don't feel, I don't think that's an authentic representation of myself. But anyway, um, that's what the Disney movies would tell me to think anyway. But setting aside these these kind of typical differences in traditional and modern cultures, some of which we've discussed before, 
like with regards to how identity is formed in these groups, like traditional cultures, it's formed much more based upon community versus modern cultures. It's, it's based upon much more concerning the individual, which of course stems from the opposite heroic narratives that define uh, these cultures, one being self-denial, the other being self-assertion. But even beyond all of that, these common responses that we have to questions concerning our identity seem to suggest that whether the culture is traditional or modern, that our identity, or at least our cultural expressions of it, tend to be made up primarily of things that are ephemeral, which is to say states of affairs that are not permanent. The roles we play, the achievements we attain, the circumstances which are thrust upon us. And yet the biblical notion of identity is very different from this because it transcends temporality. The English word identity comes from the late Latin word identitas, which literally means the same again and again. In other words, it denotes this idea of continuity. And it seems to me that it's in this literal rendering of the term, or at least perhaps this is true, that the most promising portrait of human identity is preserved which is to say that if our sense of ultimate meaning, purpose, and value is tied to things that lack that kind of continuity, that are temporal, that end, we might say, in the grave, then our identity will be insufficient to stave off the kind of despair that Friedrich Nietzsche talked about, and I think which is quite legitimate, this idea of a nihilistic sort of despair, a lack of meaning, purpose, and value. And that what it then forces us to do, if we want to survive that kind of existential onslaught, is to embrace delusion. Nietzsche's interpretation of what the world will, would be like absent God, that if God is dead, what are the consequences of that, were quite profound and they had a significant impact upon Western civilization. You see the story that Nietzsche tells, in other words, all over the place. You see it um, in Shakespeare, you see it, which comes before, of course, but you see it in uh, Leo Tolstoy, uh, you see it in every single Woody Allen movie that was uh, ever produced, which is interesting. In, in the past, I've used Woody Allen as an illustration because I grew up watching Woody Allen movies, but I grew up in the North. I think Woody Allen is more popular in the North than he is in the South. Um, because I've used him as an illustration and, and it seems to sometimes fall flat because people have never seen a, a Woody Allen movie. But if you watch any Woody Allen movie, this Nietzschean idea of the meaninglessness of the universe is at least the subtext of the movie. And it goes something like this, that if God doesn't exist, and the second law of thermodynamics is true, which essentially says that the universe is expanding and as it expands it loses energy and that that will eventuate in the heat death of the universe what's called maximum entropy and so where our universe is destined to end is sort of in this graveyard of uh, burned out stars that are just moving further and further away from one another into the recesses of space. It's the idea of the universe in ruin. And if that's the case, if that's true, then it, you seem to get the sense that it doesn't really matter what we do in this life. It may have some subjective meaning, right? It might have some meaning for us at the moment, but so much of what you accomplish in your life will be undone in your own death and if the human race is doomed to oblivion, in fact, the whole universe is doomed to oblivion, then it doesn't really matter what you do at the end of the day. I mean, the efforts of the diplomat to secure peace, the work of the researcher to cure COVID and cancer and all the rest of the diseases, at the end of the day, if everything just comes unraveled, if it just moves into total chaos, into darkness, then ultimately none of those things really matter. Everything we do, as Shakespeare said, is just sound and fury signifying nothing. It's a tale told by an idiot. And so let me try to illustrate that with regards to what I said before, connect these two things with regards to our responses to, you know, who are you? But in this life, 
one of the things that we do is we assume a number of roles. Uh, for example, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a minister, and we could go on. And each of these roles is quite different from one another, right? My role as a father, for example, is very different than my role as a son, or at least it should be because my parents are not my children, right? Likewise, my role as a son is very different than my role as a husband. Again, it needs to be because my wife is not my mother, which sounds like a Woody Allen movie right there. Um, and, you know, interesting as an aside, a lot of the dysfunction that we find in relationships is sort of a problem of bad casting, we might say. It's when someone's trying to play an ill-suited role in that particular relationship. But we have these roles, and they're very different from one another, but they're not only different, but they're also transient, notice. Because I haven't always been, and it seems I won't forever be a husband, or a father, or even a minister. Therefore, if such roles represent my identity, if they are what give me a sense of ultimate meaning, purpose, and value, then given their disparate nature and their transient nature, it seems to me that if I'm honest and I really think about things, that I'm going to be experiencing an identity crisis. Because the notion of who I am is in constant flux. It doesn't have that continuity that we were talking about. It's flipping from one fleeting function to the next. And so there seems to be a need then to ground all of these temporal functions into one which is more permanent. And the same difficulty, by the way, is discovered when one attempts to seek self-image in their achievements, right? They say, okay, I won't seek it in my roles, but I'll seek my identity, my sense of value and worth and meaning in the things that I accomplish. But you run into the same problem there. Pop legend Madonna describes the futility of this approach in a 1991 interview with Vanity Fair magazine. She says, I have an iron will. And by the way, who would doubt that if you're familiar with Madonna at all? But she says, I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. Again and again, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. Now, one thing I want to see before we get into what Madonna is talking about here is to remind us that Madonna is actually an extraordinary person in a lot of ways. I mean, if you want to talk about just influence on the culture, if you can get away with people knowing who you are just by your first name, that's an indication that you have had a significant impact on culture. So in a lot of ways, she is much more accomplished as a person than the rest of us at least when it comes to bald achievement. And so we shouldn't take the easy path or not go here immediately of just dismissing the extent of her success because of her loose morals. If you do that, I think you know, the tendency to want to do that, maybe I should say, may be an indicator of some self-righteousness that's taking place. Not the showing of discernment itself, but the idea of dismissing even her significant impact because of her unrighteousness. In other words, you might be trying to knock her down a few rungs, as I see people often do, uh, in order to make yourself feel better about your own lack of success. So the first thing I want to say is that Madonna, in many ways, is an extraordinary person when it comes to achievement. Much, has much greater achievements in the raw sense than you or I do. And yet the purpose of this quote is to demonstrate that deep within the human heart there exists a desperate need for validation as part of our identity. Indeed, honesty compels us to confess our soul's craving for this kind of recognition and approval. And yet, how can such boundless yearning be satisfied is the question. From what possible source could such vital vindication spring? 
Well, if, like Madonna, we seek affirmation in our achievements, our hearts will remain empty, no matter how successful we are. The result is this vicious cycle that she so articulately, uh, articulates uh, of having to achieve greater and greater success just in order to defer our despair. It's like drinking salt water. It has just that sort of moment of satisfaction, and then you become even more thirsty than you were before. Now again, maybe you don't relate to this sort of achievement cycle. Uh, you know, you just think, well, I just don't get that at all. And it could be that your idol is not achievement. Although living in the world we're living in, I would be surprised if that isn't true, at least in part. But also the reason why you might not relate to this is because you haven't been very successful. Let's just be honest. In other words, you haven't reached the peak of your vision of the good life, especially if you're young, and so you haven't experienced the great letdown which awaits you when you get to the top. If you want to confirm this, go talk to someone who has achieved a lot in their life and ask them of the, about the euphoria they experience when they reach the top of the ladder, and they will tell you that it was fleeting. It's this deflating, that's it? kind of moment. It's one thing to read about this truth in the book of Ecclesiastes concerning Solomon, who was maybe the most achieved person, the, the most accomplished person who ever lived, in all of the vanity that those pursuits ended in. But it's another thing to experience it in your own life, the bitter disappointment that comes, which has a way of disenchanting one from the idol of achievement. So having said all that, does this then mean that we are left with only two options in life, either despair or delusion? As a good existentialist, Woody Allen would say, yeah, that's about right. Those are your options. And so the purpose of art then, the purpose of making movies, comedies and dramas, tragedies, is to distract us from this terrible truth. And it seems to me that if there is no God, and I spent a considerable amount of my adult life so far thinking that there wasn't one. At least for me, it seemed that there were only two options. This idea of either giving up entirely or living a life of vanity. Sort of like the legendary Sisyphus who was cursed to have to roll a giant stone, you know, for eternity, roll this giant stone up the hill and as soon as it reached the top, it would roll back down again, and the next day he would have to begin again. You know, for the existentialist, people like Albert Camus, he would say, well, what we have to do is imagine that Sisyphus is content with this, that he's actually happy, right, because it gives him some meaning to his life in the sense that it gives him something to do, it gives him a purpose. But that kind of subjective meaning, the lack of objective meaning, of true meaning, purpose, and value, it seems to me, when dwelled upon, leads us to despair if we're not going to delude ourselves, as Camus suggested. Fortunately, our text provides a way of escape from this kind of futility by offering a third alternative. And specifically, this text is going to speak about this idea of our need for value. The Apostle Paul, like Madonna, was and is a person of incredible stature. Indeed, he is one of the most influential leaders, not just of his time, but of the history of the human race. And he spent a good deal of his early life trying to secure that kind of elite status. In Galatians chapter 1, we read about how Paul was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries because he was exceedingly zealous for the traditions of his fathers. And Paul also speaks about how proud he was of his pristine Jewish pedigree and his growing number of religious accomplishments. In other words, what Saul of Tarsus, that was Paul's name then, what Saul of Tarsus was striving for is what Madonna is striving for and what each of us are striving for, and that is approval an ultimate verdict that we are someone of value. But here's the paradox that we find uh, articulated by Paul. Paul only found this approval when he stopped looking for it in the most obvious places. 
when he stopped looking for it in his noble birth or in his impassioned piety, in his religious accomplishment. Paul's zealous pursuit of his own righteousness, as Paul would call it, came to a screeching halt when he was confronted by the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. Paul relays the primary takeaway from that celestial encounter in a number of places in the New Testament. One of them is our text here in Philippians chapter 3. Let me read to you again a portion of that starting in verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, and the gains here he's talking about, if you remember when I read it at the start, are his noble birth and his religious accomplishments. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God through faith. So when Paul encountered the majesty of Jesus, when he experienced that beatific vision, just as Isaiah did in the temple in Isaiah 6, he came to realize how inadequate he really was, and that his great list of religious achievements added up to very little when compared to the righteousness necessary for God's ultimate approval. And to stress this point, he uses rather crude Language. The person that says a Christian should never use crude language, I don't know the Greek language very well because it seems pretty clear that Paul's crude in this case when he speaks about our religious accomplishments apart from what God accomplishes in the cross. He refers to his pedigree and his law-keeping as essentially dung. That's what he calls them, which is a radical thing for a first century Jew to say. I mean, the idea of one's lineage and of one's law keeping were what were most important to a Jew. These are the things that are truly sacred. And Paul says that apart from the divine accomplishment of the cross, those achievements, that birthright, have zero eternal value. They are worthless. They amount to nothing. And this is why they can only offer us the illusion of a claim, of a claim, right, of praise, but never the reality. There's a limited reward that comes from them when they are pursued for their own sake, and it's the approval of man, and it's the thing that the Pharisees seemed to be content with. They were content with Jesus said, you have your reward. Right? You make your religiosity known to everyone. You stop in the middle of the street. You just happen to be in public when it was the time of prayer so everybody could see how pious you were. Jesus says you have your reward at that point. The Pharisees, part of their problem is they were content with that kind of acclaim. But that's not how one gains divine approval. Now, the necessity to look to God as the ground of identity is again discussed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 4. And the reason he gives there for that necessity is he makes the argument that only God has the authority and the knowledge and the moral rectitude necessary to make an accurate judgment in your case. Because only God knows everything about you. Right? And only God is completely free of bias. And only God has perfect wisdom, and on and on we can go. Therefore, our identity, this sense of value that we crave, if we don't want it to be rooted in falsehood, right? if we don't want it to be rooted in some imperfect judgment, someone making the judgment that doesn't even have all the data from which to draw the conclusion, if we don't want to lack confidence in that judgment, and maybe we could, in, in a more modern way, apply this to us and say, if we want to have the confidence to stand up to the blitzkrieg of nihilism that says your life has no value, 
you want to have the confidence that it does, then it seems that it ultimately has to be found in the omniscient and just judge, right? Paul essentially says this in Romans 8. If God is for you, then who can be against you, right? If God comes to you and says, you are a person of worth, who cares what anyone else has to say? It is God who justifies, who declares you righteous. If that's the case, Paul says, well, who can condemn you then? If God justifies you, no one can condemn you. Certainly not Frederick Nietzsche. Or we might reverse that and say, if God is against you, then who can be for? Who cares who's for you at that point, right? If God condemns you, then who can justify you that makes any difference? The answer is no one. Therefore, Paul says he doesn't look to the Corinthians or to any human court for validation that he's somebody. The Corinthians are harshly judging him. He says, listen, I don't really care at the end of the day how you see me because your judgment ultimately doesn't matter. It's God who's the one who can legitimately make that judgment. In fact, he's the only one that can make that legitimate judgment. And yet here's the thing. As Christians, we should know this truth. truth. The Bible speaks to it time and again. And yet how often it is that we turn from the Lord's approval and we seek a claim elsewhere. We burden our spouse or our children or our friends or our brothers and sisters in Christ or even our, our employer with the task of providing us the lasting approval that we so crave. And think about this for a minute because I think doing that is cruelty is what it is. Because only God can give you that kind of verdict. Everyone else will be crushed by the weight of such lofty expectations. I mean, imagine the burden upon a child when he figures out, and he will figure it out, that his mother is looking to him and his love to satisfy her infinite longing for recognition. A child cannot speak into a parent's life such approval, no matter how many times they express their love and adoration, for it will only create in the parent a dissatisfaction. It, it will only be temporarily satisfying, and then they will be dissatisfied, and they will, will just hunger for more. And in the end, the parent will despise the child because they didn't live up to the expectation, and the child will des despise the parent for putting such an expectation on them, or even worse, they'll despise themselves for falling short of it. And this is true not just of the child and parent relationship, <clears throat> but it's true of your spouse, your friends, <clears throat> etc. And part of this, I wonder, why is it in our culture that we are so transient? I mean, people change marriages, you know, they change churches, they change jobs, right? And I wonder if part of that really is that we're looking to these things to give us this satisfaction, this real sense of value, and they're unable to do it, and so we just shift from one to the next hoping that we'll eventually find it. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul also says, that, also says that we shouldn't try to justify ourselves. Don't look for it in others, and don't try to do it yourself. And yet, again, most of us do this very thing. Every day, if we're honest, we realize that we drag around the burden of having to prove our own worth. Every day we do this. Which means that we must convince ourselves that we are more successful or more intelligent or better at our job or better looking than the next person. And what this tells us then, if you think about it, is that it's not the achievements themselves which bring us pleasure, but rather what we think they demonstrate, our superiority to others. A truth which becomes obvious the moment we are in the presence of someone who's more successful, intelligent, and good-looking than we are. Because when we're in that instance, all of the pleasure that we did have in our, in our accomplishments dissipates instantaneously. So it's, you're not even taking pleasure in the accomplishments when you're trying to make them everything and give you a sense of value. What you're really trying to take pleasure in is being better than someone else because you're seeking worth. In other words, these attempts at self-justification destroy our ability to have any real pleasure from anything. 
in and of itself. We're using everything. We're using people and we're using our achievements and everything we do just to try to justify ourselves. And this is true also, by the way, and this is how sneaky this self-justification can get, this is true of keeping God's commandments, right? If we keep God's law because we want to use such achievements to feel superior to others, right? In order to, that's a very happy song. If we are keeping God's law because we want to use such achievement to feel superior to others in order to make ourselves feel accepted, then we will never be able to take pleasure in such precepts. We will never be able to take delight in God's law as David did, which is a point, by the way, that the Apostle Paul makes in Romans chapter 3 that I hope to come back to in a future lesson. And the second piece is that we will not be able to view God, as I said, as image bearers, view people as image bearers of God. Instead, what we do is we treat them as means to an end. We don't treat people as an end in themselves, but rather as a means to an end. We just use them to provide us that fleeting moment of acceptance and then toss them away. Another way to think of this is that we just consume them, right? And how true has this been in the churches, right? I've been to so many churches where you walk in there and they're like zombies in there, right? And what they are looking to do is if somebody comes in and they're alive for Jesus, is they want to consume that person's soul and turn them into a zombie, right? That's what legalism does. It creates this system where you're just, you know, the thing about the zombies is, is they're never satisfied. They have to keep eating brains, right? And what you're trying, it's, it's self-justification. You're constantly on the hunt to prove to yourself that you're someone of value and you consume everyone in your way in order to accomplish that. You know, it's like, it's, it's parasitic is what it is. And we all fall into it. And some people are consumed by it. Or to switch metaphors from the zombies, Tim Keller has described this perpetual search for value as being on trial every day. Every day we're in the courtroom. And in the courtroom you have the prosecution and the defense. And so every day what we're trying to do is provide evidence for the defense, but we also unfortunately provide evidence uh, for the prosecution. And so some days we feel like we're winning the trial, and then other days we feel like we're losing it. But Paul says that he's found a way out of this kind of interminable tribunal. And, and that is by remembering that in one real sense that the trial is already over for us. And therefore, we can actually just walk right out of the courtroom. Now, how can that be? Well, because the judge has already in one sense ruled in our case, which is to say that at our baptism, God publicly declares that we are righteous. And while there's certainly another judgment that's coming that Scripture talks about, this final vindication, Paul tells us that we can have sure confidence in that final verdict now. And the reason why is it's based upon what God has already done. In Romans chapter 5, which is one of the key passages on assurance in the New Testament, verses 9 through 10, Paul argues like a good rabbi from the lesser to the greater, or the greater to the lesser, depending on how you conceive of this. But he says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Because you've already been justified, God has already declared you just, this should give you great confidence that God is going to finish the work that he has begun. Verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Paul's saying, listen, he's already done the hard part, the sacrifice of his son. He's moved you from being an enemy to a friend. That was much more difficult than just sustaining the friend now unto the end. And so we should have absolute confidence 
that God is able to do it, that there won't be some kind of surprise when we get to heaven and God says, no, I'm sorry, I've changed my mind, right? I'm going to look to your works as determinant concerning your value before me. Paul says we can have confidence now. Given what God has already done, the question is, is how can we doubt that God will finish the job that he began? So based upon Christ serving the sentence in our place, we can walk out of the courtroom right now. Right? We can be set free from the burden of having to make our case every day, from having to justify ourselves every day. Set free from it if you receive this. We can be set free to treat people as ends in themselves. We can be set free to keep God's commandments out of joy rather than out of fear. We can be set free to delight in God and to truly worship Him. This is the freedom that the gospel offers. You don't have to earn God's approval. You don't. You can't. Let's be honest. You don't have to earn it. Jesus has already done that for you. Your job is to receive that truth and then respond to it with joy and to let that joy overflow into God-honoring obedience and worship. Obedience and worship that is motivated by a heart that just adores God based upon what he's done. Again, what the Bible speaks to us about when it comes to our salvation, at least in terms of its ground, how are we going to stand right before God, it calls this good news, right? It doesn't call it good advice. It calls it good news. How do you respond to good news? The consistent way is to believe it and to have joy because of it. And I think it is good news that we can be set free from this enslavement that comes in our pursuit for value in our life. 